Welcome everyone, I'm Susie Valdez and I will be your Lab Roots moderator for today's event. Thank you for joining us for a presentation titled Exploring the Great Unknown, Characterizing Complex Mixtures of Environmental Contaminants. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Shane Snyder, Executive Director of Nanyang Environment and Water Research Institute and the President's Chair in Water Technologies. For a complete biography of our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. If any questions arise during this presentation, we encourage you to submit those questions in our Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following his presentation. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Shane Snyder. I will now turn the presentation to him. Welcome, sir. I'm going to try to paint a picture today and tie it to some very recent events that we've even uh, dealt with here in Singapore related to emerging contaminants or those, say, next generation type of contaminants that we may not be able to detect easily with current technologies and what are some of the ways to continue to ensure public health as we deal with alternative water sources, be it potable water reuse or even seawater de desalination. So. Um, again, I, I certainly hope that in the future we can meet live in person and uh, have more of, uh, of uh, interdisciplinary um, collaborations. So uh, as Professor Tong mentioned, I'm, I've been uh, here at NTU now for uh, two and a half years. I feel very honored to be here in Singapore, which has a quite rich history in terms of its water management and its, its drive towards water security and independence. And it really began with the early founders of Singapore. In fact, Lee Kuan Yew once said that every policy had to bend to the knees of water survival. Indeed, we can see today the impacts of droughts on economies and food supplies and even in our ability to produce and distribute uh, electrical power. So here we are in Southeast Asia. Um, I know our friends uh, in, in Hong Kong aren't so far away, but it's hard to even see us on this dot, right, the small uh, tip of, of Malaysia. But we actually struggle quite a bit with water and water security. In fact, by some rankings, uh, one in 2015 stated that perhaps Singapore may be even the world's most water stressed country. Um, as a small island nation, it is difficult to capture uh, our rainwater in our limited catchment, limited land area, which of course that land is quite valuable, uh, likely similar scenario in Hong Kong. But over the years, we've been striving and making gains. But if we look at the region more broadly, and something I, I really hadn't thought through when I was uh, in the United States is how big Southeast Asia actually is. So. Um, here in Southeast Asia, we're home to up to 650 million people. And the population growth has been quite profound, often uh, quadrupling in population in some of our countries uh, over, since 1960, with the largest population centers, of course, being in the Philippines and Indonesia. But even Singapore has seen quite dramatic growth over that period of time. In fact, if you look at Singapore in the 1960s at 582 square kilometers, and by 2018 had increased its land capacity by about 23% through engineering. But along with that, of course, comes a consequential demand for water. And that demand continues to increase, uh, not only with population, but largely with industrial needs as well. Thus, Singapore has employed potable water reuse in the form of new water. We import water still from Malaysia, and we've built new desalination facilities and continue to expand. But as all of us know, there are new challenges on the horizon, be it in water quality or water quantity. Uh, this particular news article is from 2014, where Singapore has seen the driest month in since 1869. And what this background is showing, you see the grass is actually dead, which in the Garden City is very unusual. Even the trees are beginning to die from this lack of rainfall. And of course, that same drought was also experienced in Malaysia, our neighboring country just across the bridge to the north. And it came to such an extent that 
water rationing began to happen and certain parts of Kuala Lumpur ran out of water completely. And of course, this isn't unique to, to Southeast Asia or Asia. Uh, I show one article from Zimbabwe and uh, another from Brazil, where over the last five or so years, they've also seen um, unparalleled droughts, which again, caused disruption, not only to the water supply, of course, but also to power in hydroelectric. So there's a lot of new challenges. I expect that as the world's climate continues to evolve, we may have to be thinking about how to deal with the water crisis and to look at alternative sources. And particularly today, I want to address potable water reuse, where we intentionally engineering take our wastewater and convert it into high value, even very high purity water through engineering. Another example from California, where I spent a lot of my time when I was in the Western United States, and just to show how fast things can change, in 2011, one of these primary reservoirs for Northern California looked quite full, quite abundant. And within three years, that same reservoir was essentially completely diminished. And it caused not only disruptions to the municipal system, but it caused large disruptions to the economy, with some companies actually threatening to leave California if they could not secure their water supply. So around that time, the governor of California did something that was quite surprising, I think, to many of us, especially even to me working in the industry, was to mandate the development of water quality criteria, or water recycling criteria, for direct potable reuse. So in Singapore, we use indirect potable reuse, whereby we purify to a high degree our wastewater, put it back into our reservoirs where it's blended, then pull it out and treat it through uh, conventional or advanced drinking water treatment facilities. But in California, they're moving quickly towards this idea of direct potable reuse, whereby we would not have a typical drinking water plant, but rather an advanced water recycling facility that can directly place that finished product into the distribution system for drinking. And actually, economically, it makes a lot of sense. So what's the big challenge? Well, <laughs> public perception for one. Um, often, I think rightfully so, the public has tied the history of pollution, even if we think back on the uh, plagues that, that struck the world and even into the early 1900s, many of these were waterborne disease. And of course, reports um, such as emerging contaminants that, that I've enjoyed working on, endocrine disruptors or pharmaceuticals. But again, the public facing some degree of skepticism about whether or not we can safely and reliably build systems that have high redundancy and are protective against not only the chemicals that are regulated, but these rather unknown or emerging contaminants. So again, just a, a couple articles you can see that were in the, in the news in America, you know, is my tap water safe to drink? Finding different levels of industrial chemicals in, in, in the water for Americans. And of course, many of you may have heard about the unfortunate uh, incident in Flint, Michigan involving lead and the leaching of lead into drinking water. So the public has become skeptical of, at least in North America, of the drinking water in general, let alone as we try to move forward and, and utilize alternative sources of water, such as water recycling. So a very recent incident here in Singapore. This is from the 23rd of July. It kept my uh, phone quite busy for a few days. In uh, certain parts of Singapore and in Malaysia, the water began to have an off smell. The water actually smelled kind of sweet, uh, like the fruit pandan, and uh, was reported um, by uh, customers both in Singapore and Malaysia. And of course, the, the agency, we're fortunate to have a very progressive water agency for the nation, Singapore PUB, has already begun to look at ways to enhance the treatment process. And I like this last statement. They note that at current, screening technologies really do not allow for the detection of trace amounts, in this case of an organic chemical, tetrahydrofuran, which was responsible for that odor I mentioned before. So what we realize is that our water systems are susceptible 
and regardless of, of how advanced the treatment may be, there are all, always be certain chemicals that are able to evade the system. And we have to think more holistically about the health impacts, if any, and how we can better detect and deal with um, emerging contaminants. So I was very impressed when this THF uh, spill happened in Malaysia and detected in Singapore. It's interesting that the first detector was not an instrument, it was people's nose. So the human nose is still hard to beat. But regardless, very quickly, um, Singapore PUB was able to utilize their analytical capabilities and determine the, the, the chemical as being uh, tetrahydrofuran or THF. So I think even though online sensors may not be able to immediately detect a chemical such as THF, we do have the tools to very quickly identify almost anything that you can imagine um, in the water supply. But this begs the bigger question. <laughs> Are we looking for the right things? Are we really understanding what has the most impacts to our treatment systems, to public health, and are important for our monitoring systems. So what is it we should monitor for? And I've spent a lot of time on various uh, expert panels, both for the, for the federal government, uh, US EPA, and especially in California around their water reuse. And this topic uh, goes round and round. Even with um, the time I've spent working with the World Health Organization, it's very difficult to say what are the most important substances to monitor. So just think about it. If we have, say, an effluent, be it industrial or municipal, and we just want to say, is it safe or not safe? That is an extremely difficult um, question to answer. In fact, it's not really um, an analytical question. It's more of a biological or toxicological question. So what is it? in this complex mixture that's important to monitor. So where do we see examples? So I just show a few from Southeast Asia. If we look at uh, Metro Manila and the satellite image, you can see that there are black plumes that are coming from the um, urban water systems, a highly dense system, and, and definitely making uh, strides to improve the environmental quality, but yet definitely a challenging environment. So what are the substances, if any, in these plumes that may be impactful to aquatic health or even to human health. In Lake Mead, Nevada, this is the water supply for the city of Las Vegas, Nevada, but also the water supply for about 30 million people in the downstream of the Colorado River in the United States. In the early 2000s, we had this, um, as I'm showing here, epic um, algal bloom, never before seen in the history of the reservoir. And Lo and behold, we were surprised that this included toxic strains of algae, including Cylindrus bermopsin. So we are dealing with a lot of unexpected consequences um, through climate change and urbanization and industrialization. This is an example of an acid mine drainage in Pennsylvania. This is my home state where, where I was born and my family lives. And surprisingly, this is not ancient history. This is 2009. So we are, we have a lot of, of, of room to grow and we have a lot um, of engineering and, and analytical uh, work ahead to better protect the environment and public health. So that begs the question. So how many chemicals are there in use today? And again, spending a, uh, quite a bit of time on the EPA Science Advisory Board and in the World Health Organization, I can tell you that we can barely keep up with the chemical inventory. That is, do we even know how many chemicals are actually in commerce? And do we think that all the chemicals in commerce have been tested? That's absolutely not true. In fact, the vast majority have not been tested for endpoints relevant to drinking water or even environmental discharge. And at least in, in the United States, there's some effort to, to try to better characterize these chemicals uh, through a series of, of biological testing. But even if that type of regulation were to be employed, and we estimate it could take centuries to get through the current inventory of chemicals, let alone the very rapid pace of chemical discovery that we see today. So for me and my, my journey, 
really began back in the 1990s. I was a, a graduate student at Michigan State University. I worked with a very well-known guy, uh, Professor John Giese, and we were faced with an amazing uh, discovery. And that is that fish living in the effluence of Las Vegas, the city of Las Vegas, were experiencing what we would call estrogenic impact. In other words, the fish were obviously exposed to chemicals which could impact their reproductive system. And that discovery was actually made by the national agency, the US Geological Survey. But Michigan State University and I, myself as a student became quite engaged because what we didn't know was what was causing it. And there were a lot of hypotheses, but nobody was quite sure. And of course, this reservoir, Lake Mead, as I said, serves the drinking water for millions of people. So it caused a tremendous amount of public outcry and, and, and concern. So this is a type of water reuse. I mean, the city of Las Vegas is discharging its wastewater back into its own drinking water reservoir so that they have enough water supply to sustain a very thirsty, arid city. So January 1st, 1998, uh, our study got some amazing publicity, perhaps ironically, in environmental science and technology. So what we were able to do, and at least attributed in this article for being the first time in North American history, was to tie the effect that had been seen in the fish to the occurrence of natural and synthetic estrogens. The natural ones being primarily the estrogen that all of us carry, of course, uh, women more than men, but, but all animals have, and the synthetic estrogen hormone, methionoestradiol, which is primarily used as an oral birth control medication, but it has other uh, medical applications as well. So how are we able to do this? This is, again, in the, in the late 1990s. And we, were, we published two pieces of the work around that study were published in environmental science and technology. And what we were able to do, the way we were able to figure this out was to actually combine analytical measurements with biological um, cellular assays. So what I'm showing here in the screen is a little tricky to see perhaps, but the chromatogram is actually liquid chromatography with fluorescence. The white lines represent fractions. So we used a fraction collector to collect a fraction of that LC uh, chromatogram, and then we tested it in the very bottom pane. You can see what I call E2 max, which is the percent of estradiol or natural estrogen induction in a human breast cancer cell. So we had genetically engineered human breast cancer cells to produce light. So when a chemical or mixture of chemicals would bind to the human endogenous estrogen receptor, it would cause a light production that we could easily measure with a uh, plate scanning spectrophotometer. So if you kind of look at the left pane, you can see this high degree of estrogenicity. It looks like what, 90% occurring somewhere between say five and looks like eight minutes, a little bit less uh, around the 10 minute mark and not really a lot of estrogenicity. In fact, the red bars being the 95% uh, confidence interval. And if you look carefully at the chromatogram on the, the left screen, you see another peak, and there's a very large peak, it's off um, of the linear range, which turns out to be nonalphenol, which is a known um, estrogen, um, a synthetic estrogen. And that's the chemical we thought was causing the effect. We were, as a student, I was quite certain about it. But if you look to the right, what we realized is that it didn't really match up. And it took us some time and we were really following in the footsteps of Professor John Sumter in the United Kingdom and others who realized that actually E2 being the natural estrogen of all humans and EE2 being a thinoestradiol, which is the primary, uh, again, pharmaceutical used for oral birth control, were accounting for essentially all of the estrogenicity. So again, the way we are able to solve this is this combination of both biological and analytical technologies. I mentioned it already, but just to show a little bit of how this genetically engineered cell line works, we expose the cells to um, a bit of the chemical extract extracted from the water generally in a solvent like DMSO or methanol. And 
then, of course, the chemicals, if they're capable of migrating through the cellular membrane and the nuclear membrane, they can become bound to the, uh, in this case, uh, the estrogen receptor. And if so, the estrogen receptor elements, uh, which are endogenous to the cell, then upregulate the uh, luciferin gene that we've inserted into the cell. And when we add external luciferase, we have a light production which is easy to quantify. So this, again, remember this is in the 1990s. So I'll show you, we've come a long way since the 1990s. And again, just, just another um, news article from 2006. Again, this kind of findings in the water really did become quite a concern for the public. So as we continue down this path towards more and more direct type potable water reuse, we have to remember these incidents which happened not a uh, hundred years ago, but just you know ten to twenty years ago. And my final my final uh, word about this particular estrogen was that you know we're talking about potential impacts to humans, which probably is unlikely at the concentrations that are out there. But it has been clearly demonstrated that those same levels that we detected could cause even extinction to certain species of fish. This was published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 2007, where an entire lake in Canada was dosed with around seven to nine parts per trillion of ethinoestradiol, which is in the same general range of what we were discovering in the environment. So these can have environmental consequence. So what's next? What's the next big thing? I'm showing data now that's 10, I guess even 20 years old at this point in time. I think it's best if we just back up from chemical by chemical thinking and just accept the fact that almost any chemical in commerce in our house produced whether synthetically or even natural chemicals have a degree of propensity to enter into our sewer system and subsequently into the environment, even to our drinking water, be it pharmaceuticals, of course, pesticides, but also even oxyhalides like perchlorate, which has caused quite a bit of concern. And we certainly shouldn't forget about the pathogens. Uh, today, uh, my laboratory here in Singapore spends quite a bit of our time monitoring the COVID uh, virus, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, in our wastewater system as an indicator for the degree of infectivity. And I realize around the world, a lot of people are doing that. So that's another example of how our sewers, in fact, do carry a lot of information and also some risk. The other thing to remember is that chemical discovery continues. You know, even at, at any point in time when we say we may, we, we can look at a certain list of chemicals in commerce, we actually have been estimated to add up to 15,000 new structures per day into the chemical abstract service. So you can see that, you know, uh, in 50 years, over 100 million chemicals were added to that list. You can see how rapid that discovery has become in the recent times, say from 2005 to 2015. And uh, in 2014, more chemicals were added to the Chem Abstract Registry than in all the years from 1965 to 1990. And that trend continues. So how, how do we come, how do we begin to try to get our arms around uh, methodologies to characterize and protect public and environmental health? Well, of course, we will never, in my opinion, stop doing targeted quantification. And the tools in our, that we have available today are better than ever. Our triple quadrupole mass spectrometers with liquid and gas interfaces, of course, inorganics by things like uh, inductively coupled plasma MS or ion chromatography. We have incredible tools that even when I was a student were nearly unimaginable today, they're becoming more and more uh, routine. But the, the area I'm most fascinated about are the non-targeted. So how do we even begin to think about characterizing the unknown? And that's how do we get ahead of the estrogens or of perchlorate before they release into the environment and cause an impact to health? And we do this mainly through high resolution mass spectrometry um, and uh, various hyphenated techniques and I also want to explore with you a bit more about what I mentioned in cell bioassay. So one of, I think one of the leading groups in, in, in this area had been in California because of the mandate I showed you from the governor 
and the drive towards more potable reuse and direct potable reuse even. So they convened um, an ex a series of expert panels and I've been fortunate enough, I guess fortunate enough, to be a member of several of those panels. And this is just an example of one of the reports that we uh, shared. And what we recommended to the government was a tiered approach. So tier one being the most uh, inexpensive, most rapid, and preferably online uh, techniques to monitor water quality. So I'm gonna show you examples of these in a minute. But you can imagine things like online DOC, UV 254, uh, fluorescence, and other things like conductivity, et cetera. Tier two is what we would like to call our targeted analysis, very similar to what we do in a regulatory context, but we have a, a new way of looking at it where we call indicators or indicator species, where we pick uh, representative chemistries and we use them instead of trying to monitor for everything. And in the third tier, these are our most um, novel and most challenging and, and frankly most expensive techniques we begin to peer more into this unknown world. We recommended these with lesser frequency, but yet to think carefully about how these different tiers can combine. And if you're interested in that, I'm not gonna go further into it, but you can read about that uh, in this report that I cite below. I don't wanna dwell on this, but it's incredible to me how fast analytical technology has grown. From when I was a student, um, in one of our publications, we were extracting 100 liters of water to try to quantify into the, say, tens of parts per trillion. Today, we don't even need extraction. Um, here, even in Nuri, we just received a uh, even newer instrument that I'm show than I'm showing here, where we can just inject a few microliters of water with no treatment and quantify easily into single digit or even sub parts per trillion. So it is getting faster, and I think the quality of the data also is beginning to improve. So how do we pick these chemicals? Let's just take a look at some examples now. I'll put together now some case studies. So again, this, this actually does come from the State of California expert report, where we suggested looking at the different applications, but more importantly, the structure. So those of us who are, are chemists here can appreciate that whether a chemical is a pharmaceutical or disinfection byproduct or a, um, a pe pesticide, whatever, it doesn't really matter. What matters is, is it toxic? And part of that is based on its structure. So how does it move through water, its solubility, volatility, and its impact to health? So we said, let's look at a very structural diversity, including specifically the structures uh, shown in this blue color column. And then look at your monitoring data. So I'm just showing a study that the, the, my research team had done where we were monitoring a wastewater treatment effluent uh, bound for water reuse in Southern Arizona, United States. And after uh, quarterly monitoring, we were able to put together a table like this where we show to the left, the chemicals that occurred at the highest frequency, but also the highest concentration. And as you go to the right, chemicals with lesser frequency and, and lower concentration. Now, this tells us nothing about the toxicity, I wanna be clear, but it's a great way to do um, indicator occurrence. So why is that important? Well, if we pick things like on the, on the, sorry, the left of the screen, like sucralose, an artificial sweetener, or TCPP, which is a flame retardant, we can begin to look at the ratio of these compounds and we know if wastewater, human influence is occurring, if there's a, even a treatment failure, we can detect that without measuring the whole gamut. So we can begin to build relationships that actually make the monitoring program a bit uh, less rigorous. So I just show some examples of chemicals that we generally pick um, as indicators to represent broader classes. Uh, one thing that's important um, and I can't stress enough is of course, the indicators that you select need to be geographically uh, um, representative. So this is a little bit tricky to see this. So I'll just say quickly, this is again, some data from Southern Arizona here that I'm showing now. And if we compare that to some monitoring data uh, from Singapore, and we just look at some of the most widely detected compounds, we see some similarities. Uh, like sucralose is common. But we also see some very big differences. It's interesting that the type of x-ray contrast media we see predominantly in the United States, iopamidol, 
is a different structure than what we see in Singapore, which is IO Hexol. Both of them are iodinated contrast media, but apparently one is favored in the, in the US as compared to Singapore. So it is important to ground this in your local um, um, scenario. So what's another important way to look at the indicator? Well, we want it to be representative of water treatment efficacy. And to do that, we want to look at the particular process. I think I'll show you two processes. The first is biological, so say secondary uh, wastewater treatment. So the dominant uh, chemical attenuation will be through biotransformation or microbial degradation and through sorption or binding into the biosolids. So I have here um, you know, some categories we came up with. And if we see this red box with the members of the carbamazepine, meprobamate, primidone, those are all pharmaceuticals, or TCEP, which is a flame retardant, and again, sucralose being the artificial sweetener, they are not well bound to the biosolids and they're also very resistant to biotransformation. That means that they are ubiquitous, as I showed previously, in nearly every wastewater treatment plant, um, certainly in the United States, but also commonly detected in other parts of the world, depending on usage. Um, likewise, if you kind of look down in the lower right corner, you see triclosan and fluoxetine, fluoxetine being a, a drug also known as Prozac, we really don't see them that frequently in the wastewater because they are quite rapidly bio degraded and, and they're quite well bound to the biosolids. So if we see those at high concentrations, it may also tell us that something has went awry in the treatment train. Another quick example, and, and all these examples I'm showing are published, so if you're interested, I'm happy to provide the reference. In ozonation, we can do the same thing. We can begin to look at reactivity and things like carbamazepine, which are obviously resistant to secondary wastewater treatment, are very highly susceptible to ozone. Whereas if we look at this group four of iopamidol, it is very resistant to ozone um, and it makes a great indicator um, if we're looking at the process of whether or not the treatment process is effective for ozonation. And I guess one more example would be uh, around UV hydrogen peroxide and advanced oxidation. Again, the same story, so I won't go reading through this, but we're showing something a little bit extra here I'm gonna transition into, which is fluorescence. So on the right side, we can actually see a change in fluorescence. It's better to see it mathematically than graphically, but significant changes as we increase the dose and hydrogen peroxide. So it's another way to track the efficacy, and we call that a surrogate approach. So I'll spend a few minutes uh, discussing surrogates such as that last example of fluorescence. So let's step back to ozone again, one of my most favorite technologies. Very powerful oxidant and very complex chemistry. And we know that ozone is an incredible disinfectant, especially for viruses like, like the COVID responsible virus, but also for more resilient organisms such as cryptosporidium. Here we're showing an example for um, E. coli, and you can see that the ozone, in fact, quite, quite apparently is able to oxidize the, the cellular membrane and destroy, inactivate the bacteria. But we found some really um, interesting applications for ozone at very low doses, where we can actually begin to control um, reverse osmosis membrane fouling. So we've done quite a bit of work that has been published again uh, previously, where at relatively low doses, we can have a substantial reduction in fouling. Um, this was published in the Journal of Membrane Science a few years back, but we were even looking at how to get higher recovery through brine recycling. And with relatively low doses of ozone, we get a much higher uh, or lesser flux decline, I should say. I don't wanna go deep into this, but this, it's a bit challenging. We also saw this same phenomenon for uh, microfiltration fouling. Uh, using different types of membranes. So again, relatively low doses of ozone, yielding pretty substantial gains in reduction of membrane fouling or flux decline. However, <laughs> uh, no good deed goes unpunished. Um, in California, they decided to explore this at full scale, which we would have cautioned maybe jumping that quick, but nonetheless, um, a full-scale pre-ozone system was employed 
uh, to help reduce membrane fouling, uh, particularly the MFUF uh, system at a water recycling plant. But unfortunately, um, some of the membranes became very brittle quickly and shattered and caused uh, quite a bit of damage. So we wanted to explore well, why would that happen? And, and the main problem is trying to control the ozone dose. Typically, probably many of you realize that we control ozone by ozone residual. And that is, we add enough ozone to the water, we can measure dissolved ozone and control the process. But for these gains, both in contaminant oxidation and membrane fouling control, we don't need ozone residual. We don't want ozone residual. So how do we control it and better protect the downstream processes? And at least one of the answers will be in fluorescence. I think that there's a very uh, good future in controlling water treatment, not only for ozone, but other processes based on the intrinsic fluorescence. This is not fluorescence from emerging contaminants, but fluorescence from the natural organic matter. So here we can see uh, ozone in a uh, recycled water. We can see the control uh, before any ozone. And as we add relatively low doses, well, up to a fairly high dose at six, but we can see a very clear bleaching effect. And we looked at that more closely. We can actually see this not only for fluorescence, which is on the right with TF for total fluorescence, we can also see this in UV absorption or UV transmission, which I show on the left. Now, the benefit of fluorescence is it's more sensitive, more sensitive and somewhat better linear correlation, not always, but the sensitivity in the dynamic range for fluorescence is definitely better than UV, but UV also works quite well. So let's get into the most fun part and start to wrap up here. But what about um, as we get to even deeper? So we know we have the indicator approach, the, the surrogate approach we can use even for process control. But let's take a look at non-targeted analysis. So many of you probably know about nitrosodimethylamine or NDMA. This is a very controversial um, generally a disinfection byproduct, but it's a chemical that's been studied in literature for a very long time. It is a well-known car carcinogen. There's no doubt about that. It's been used as a positive control. If you want to cause cancer in an animal, you can give it enough NDMA and it will generally develop tumors. So when we were looking at this concept of pre-ozonation for membrane fouling control, we unfortunately realized that another consequence was that as we added ozone to the uh, secondary or tertiary effluent, we formed very high levels of NDMA. And to put that into perspective, the World Health, Law, World Health Organization's guideline is 100 parts per trillion. California has an action limit of 10 parts per trillion, and the US EPA has identified a one in a million cancer risk of 0 0.7 parts per trillion or 700 parts per quadrillion, hard to even imagine. And you can see that as we added ozone, we far exceeded any known guideline for NDMA. So that begs the question, well, if we formed NDMA, what else did we form? And to look at that, we begin to explore high resolution mass spectrometry. Here we show liquid chromatography with, with quadrupole time of flight analysis could also be done, should be done also with gas chromatography. I'll just show you an LC example now. So this is that same water and we're looking at four doses of ozone. And if you look at these chromatograms, you might think, or I would think, they look very similar. You might be able to identify something different, but probably not. But if we begin to statistically look, if we get, begin to use the power of PCA type software, we can begin to realize that these waters are dramatically different in composition. So here's a PCA plot of that same exact data, and you can see that they group quite well to each other, but yet they are much different than each other within the doses or the control. So we can begin to look at this in different heat maps. We can see that some compounds are formed, some compounds are removed, and we can go into very deep dive analysis. So I just want to show you, let's, let's take that apart and look at one chemical we discovered, which is benzotriazole. This is a very common anti-corrosion agent. It's essentially ubiquitous in wastewater uh, because it's used in detergents. And when we add ozone, we can say, well, wow, it's very quickly disappears. It, it, it is no longer present after ozone. 
So what we did, we actually coupled our ozone reactor directly to the quadrupole time of flight mass spectrometer. And this red line that I'm trying to show here in this top chromatogram is the moment we added ozone. So this is like a real time, near real time connection between the ozone reactor and the mass spectrometer. So what we see is, is as we add ozone, the benzotriazole begins to decay. It begins to go down in concentration. But we see this green line, which is a transformation product, which is beginning to form. If we look at the bottom where we zoom in closer, we see that actually uh, several different transformation products form. But one in particular that we form is this compound, uh, the dicarbaldehyde. So it's quite stable. So in the drinking water, the benzotriazole would be, if you will, gone after ozone, but instead we would be consuming the dicarbaldehyde. So that begs the question, which one is more risky to human health? Maybe none, hopefully none. But to say that we've removed benzotriazole, well, that's not quite accurate. We have actually just transformed it into a byproduct. And that is true of nearly every oxidation process. Rarely do we mineralize organic structures to carbon dioxide, but rather we transform them into something different. And we hope that that something different is something not toxic and hopefully maybe biodegradable by a downstream biofilter, but not always. A couple of quick examples to drive home the point. Remember the pharmaceutical I mentioned that's quite ubiquitous in wastewater, carbamazepine. Uh, again, just using a very low dose of ozone at one milligram, we see that the carbamazepine drops in, in its magnitude, but we immediately see a transformation product that forms. If we look deeper into the mass spec data, I won't get into that, but what we see is the formation of a transformation product called BQM. And BQM is actually known to be toxic uh, to, to human health at, at certain concentrations. So again, we eliminated, if you will, or transformed carbamazepine, but we formed a known byproduct uh, that is uh, in fact toxic at, at high concentration. So I'm running low on time. I'm gonna go through this last example yet um, in the last few minutes to try to put this all together. Now this was work we did a few years back and published in ESNT where we had a, an interesting discovery. Uh, I already mentioned some of the advantages of bioassays, but of course it's the ability to screen more broadly than we can with just analytical chemistry. So we did an interesting study with a company out of uh, Stanford, uh, California, that had essentially the whole human genome available as plasmids to transfect cells to look at different toxicities. And we did all kinds of endpoints, but I just want to show endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals uh, for an example. In this screen here, in this panel to the left, you see G-R-A-R-E-R. -E -R. G, G R is glucocorticoid receptor activity. A-R is androgen, like male hormone. And E-R is estrogen, like I talked about before. And what we saw is relatively little estrogen. This Roger Road wastewater treatment plant is a quite antiquated uh, trickling filter system, which has since been um, destroyed and rebuilt as an advanced system. But what we were really not expecting was this high degree of glucocorticoid activity, or GR. And we were very surprised that every time we applied UV treatment processes, the toxicity seemed to go down dramatically. This is a log two scale. So these are quite high levels of induction. So this is something that we had not seen before. Um, there was very little literature on this. So we wanted to explore it more deeply. First of all, of course, I always tell my students, always start with the lit review. Uh, we we're quite surprised to see that glucocorticoids are actually the most widely prescribed, the most by concentration, at least in some countries, as compared to estrogens I talked about before, or even the, the male hormones, androgens or progestins. In fact, glucocorticoids are nearly uh, three times uh, higher than uh, some of the other estrogens. And same is true uh, in America. And we have an interesting thing that happened in the United States. In 2014, the US Food and Drug Administration approved two nasal sprays, one that I actually continue to use most, most nights, um, which contain uh, glucocorticoid steroids. So before this, you had to get them from your doctor or prescription. In 2014, they became over the counter. So we had this toxicity I showed on the first screen. 
So what did we do? Well, we went through that same basic workflow. We screened the samples with the bioassay. Then we would fractionate, um, in this case, by liquid chromatography. We also did size exclusion uh, chromatography. We would test each fraction. And when we had a fraction with activity, we'd go back to the mass spectrometer, and we would try to figure out what is causing that toxicity. Again, you know, that same kind of workflow with the statistical analyses. And on the right, you can start to see the identities of some of the compounds uh, that were present and causing toxicity. So once we had a list of chemicals, we needed better quantification. So we had to go back to the LC triple quadruple and build a more sp a specific, more accurate way to quantify the substances in the environment. So when we put the data together, and again, this was published in ESNT, we get an interesting dist distribution of different wastewater treatment plant effluents. And what we see very rapidly is this chemical, I'm gonna call this TCA for short, um, that's highlighted, <clears throat> represented between 50 and say 75% of the glucocorticoid receptor loading. But what that doesn't tell us is about the toxicity, and that was the most uh, amazing part, which I'll show now. So in the bioassay, again, this is a human cell construct with a glucocorticoid receptor with a reporter gene. We are able to test this different glucocorticoid compounds. And these are logarithmic scales. So you can see that some of these things are extremely potent, very toxic, if you will. And some are far less, orders of magnitude apart. So on the right, we convert this to what we call relative effective potency. And the reason dexamethasone has a one is that was our positive control. Up until this study, we thought that dexamethasone was the most powerful glucocorticoid, so it became our standard, and we normalized to one. But what you can see quite quickly below the dexamethasone is the TCA at 2.2, meaning it was 2.2 times more, I'll loosely use the word toxic, but bioactive, than was the dexamethasone. And this one down here called Clobetasol propionate was 37 times more powerful and more potent than our positive control. This is how we begin to do the mass balance. In terms of the treatment, we can see again that ozone was effective, but at relatively higher doses. But UV was extremely effective at even low doses, even doses at disinfection level, ultraviolet was effective. So where did this leave us? Where does this take us? Well, today we're moving more and more forward into new types of new generations of, of platforms that can go far beyond the work I showed even from the last five years. Uh, here in our laboratory in Singapore, my, my team uh, is doing quite a bit of work with zebrafish uh, embryos. These are considered in vitro up until a point where the fish are sacrificed before they become uh, juveniles. And we can do a lot of work on micro uh, array, looking at the genetics and gene expression assays. And we show down here we can even genetically engineer the fish so that they can fluoresce, and in, in, even in different colors, if you will, um, for different organ systems, such as the neurons or the kidney or the liver system. So pretty amazing technology we have that can be fully utilized to screen our water. And I should also add that this technology was not developed, uh, I think, with environmental applications in mind. It was developed to look for pharmaceutical discovery. We're just apl applying it in a new way to better screen both water, also air, even soil samples. And when I came into NTU, uh, one of the things I was just most impressed with, just to give you an idea of where we're heading, is that um, um, some of our team members from our medical school here at NTU were actually growing organoids. Uh, in this case, they're growing a kidney organoid. And you can, if you look closely, you can actually see that this organoid actually has different uh, tubules. It's growing blood vessels. It is beginning to look, in a very small scale, like a miniature human kidney. And so kidney has been a... a, a um, target vessel for disinfection byproducts. In fact, there have been several papers that attribute high levels of disinfection byproducts with incidence of kidney cancer. So this allows us to study that effect in a new way without using mice, without using animal testing. 
in vitro with human cells, with human organs or organoids, if you will. And I think that that future looks extremely bright and should be employed by the water industry. So we're also seeing, and this is actually getting a bit dated at 2014, but these, these types of in vitro um, bioassays are actually gaining more and more traction. This article talks about not only in vitro, but in silico or modeling, whereby we are getting better and better at predicting human toxicity or, or um, even aquatic uh, life form toxicity without the need for, for animal testing. We will never get our answers from traditional animal testing. It's too slow, um, it's too labor intensive, and the mixtures are just too daunting. So I think this combination of in vitro work, bioassays, and uh, analytical testing with, with high resolution mass particularly will really take us to, to a better understanding. And I think it'll also help us gain public trust and public acceptance. Thank you, Dr. Snyder, for that outstanding presentation. And we will now move to the live Q&A portion of the presentation. As a reminder, please submit your questions via the Q&A box. And I would like to now welcome Mr. Mauricius Marquis Dos Santos from New Re AEBC, who will be joining us for our live Q&A. Welcome, Mauricius. Mauritius, our first question is, what are the challenges of doing unknowns screening with current analytical technologies? And Mauritius, I'm so sorry, but we can't actually hear you. Can you do me a favor and turn your volume back on? And while you're doing that, I wanna thank our audience for participating today, great conference held by Agilent. Um, keep giving us those questions. Welcome, Mauritius. Oh, we still can't hear you. There should be a little area at the bottom of where your video bridge is that will allow you to unmute and you just kind of click on that and it should turn green. Mm, nope. Um, thank you, audience members, for your patience. This occasionally happens, so we thank you for your patience. Right down at the middle of that, um, that screen, the video bridge, you'll see an area, and it'll have a microphone on it, and you can unmute it. And if that doesn't work to the right of that, um, where your picture is, where we're seeing you, um, you should see a little area where you can change your microphone to the right. And again, thank you so much for all of your patience. I do want to remind you that Agilent's conference is a two-day conference, and there's going to be some more great presentations tomorrow. And we um, welcome you to participate in that, so please join us tomorrow as well. <clears throat> And I know we'll have Mauricius up in a second. There's also a great exhibition that you should check out. It's awesome. As I said earlier, Agilent always goes all out. 
Have you found that yet? It's gonna be on the bottom right of your screen in that area where your picture is. There should be a little area when you kind of put your cursor over it and a microphone will pop up. And as soon as that microphone pops up, you kind of have to move. Oh, I think I heard you. Hello. Yay. How wonderful. Yeah, Hi. sorry about the, the technical troubles, That's okay. I guess. Those are we kind of the, common these days. We have the best audience members at Labroots, so I didn't see a single person leave. <laughs> okay, yeah, so welcome, perfect. thank you. Welcome, and we're so glad you could participate, um, Mauricius. Let me give you that Q&A question one more time, all right? Okay. And again, I want to encourage our audience members to submit questions, and any questions we don't answer today will be answered via email um, after the presentation by our presenter. What are the challenges of doing unknown screening with current analytical technologies? Okay. Well, thank you. Um, there's still quite a few challenges uh, in the unknown targeted untargeted screening today. So most of them are related to having to having no universal technology. So you still need to use both liquid chromatography and gas chromatography to be able to get a full picture. But not only that, you also have uh, different uh, compounds that are ionized by different um, ionization techniques. So while you're doing um, ESI ionization, you, you get some sort of results, but while you're doing APCI ionization, you, you might cover different um, classes of chemicals. So one of the great challenges is still trying to, to cover the entire unknown universe, but uh, you still need to apply different techniques like the GCQ TOF and LCQ TOF. And the other second um, great challenge is on the data processing side where there's still a lot of, is a big data type of technology where there's still a lot of need for a uniform type of data processing technology. Thank you so much, Mauricius. And while we have to close today, or, um, right now, because we have no more time for questions, would you like to provide some closing remarks for our audience before we leave today? Yeah. I would, I, would, I would just say, like, if anyone is interested in knowing anything about uh, anything more about NERI or about the research on, at our group with Prof. Shane Snyder, uh, please feel free to to reach out to him or to to anyone at NERI. Yeah. Thank you so much. I want to thank you both, Dr. Snyder, Mr. Marquis Dos Santos. Thank you again, both of you, for tonight for today. And I want to thank our audience for your outstanding questions. Any questions that were submitted and not answered today by our speaker will be addressed via email. And this presentation will be available for on-demand viewing through September 2021. Please share it with your colleague who may have been interested in today's topic. And thank you again for your participation and your patience. And I hope to see you tomorrow for our more informative presentations at the second day of the Agilent Science and Technology Virtual Symposium. And check out the exhibition hall. Awesome. Until next time, take care and bye-bye.